His name is Thelonious Sphere Monk. That is his real name. He was Thelonious after his father, and Sphere after his maternal grandfather. He was born in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. When he was only five years old, Thelonious and his mother and siblings moved up to Manhattan, to an area known as San Juan Hill. This part of town was notable as the largest black community prior to World War I, as many of its African-American residents had fought in the Spanish-American War in Cuba. It would later be ironically and controversially removed to make way for the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. From here on, the story of Thelonious Monk is a New York story. I know that. He spent the rest of his life there and was undeniably influenced by that city. But his roots were in Rocky Mount, and one of the greatest and most unique talents in jazz music came from North Carolina. We'll get back to that later. Thelonious picked up piano at the age of six. A neighbor taught him lessons in the stride style of Fats Waller and others. You can hear that influence on many of his tunes. Monk attended Stuyvesant High School, a school for gifted teens, and apparently was great at math and physics, although he never graduated. Later, he also briefly attended Juilliard. Monk was declared physically unfit for military duty during World War II, and as a result, he was able to hone his craft in New York with legends like Coleman Hawkins and Dizzy Gillespie. From the early 1940s to the 50s, Thelonious Monk wrote some of the most popular pieces of music in jazz history. In fact, he is considered the founder, or at least one of the founders, of bebop jazz, a typically lightning-fast style that took off in the 1940s and 50s. From that early period, Thelonious Monk wrote some of the most popular pieces of music in jazz history. To this day, his catalog is the second most recorded by other artists, second only to Duke Ellington. Now, this is pretty amazing when you consider that Ellington wrote over a thousand songs during his career, and Monk only wrote about 70. Those are some pretty in-demand tunes. One important thing to know about musicians in New York at this time was that because of cabaret laws enacted during Prohibition, all musicians in the city were required to carry cabaret cards. It was basically your license to play music. However, New York cops could and frequently did revoke cabaret cards for any reason, on a whim. And this could often be because of racial profiling. Many of the greatest names in jazz had their cards revoked at one time or another, and Monks was revoked three times in the 40s and 50s for drug charges. Most non-card-carrying musicians would then go on tour around the U.S., since most cities didn't have these laws, but Monk didn't want to leave New York. Instead, he would pop up in nightclubs to play unannounced gigs. He would also play in smaller neighborhood venues in the boroughs, sometimes using the pseudonym Ernie Washington. He also wrote some of his best music during periods of cardlessness. The 1957 album Brilliant Corners, considered one of his very best, was written when Monk had lost his card. It's widely thought to be the album that really put Monk on the map with a wider audience. Much has been said and written about what makes Monk, Monk. His unique style is unmistakable. You can't hear his playing and think that it's anyone else behind the keys. He has a tendency to attack the keys with a punchy force. If you know what accidental notes are, Monk's music is chock full of them. Whereas most music will try to contain its notes to just the scale or complementary scales of the music's key signature, accidental notes live outside those scales and will tend to sound jarring or surprising. 
There was a time when all music in the Western world had to be played so that all the notes were in key. Monk and the bebop musicians made the case that other notes were okay too. Monk was quoted as saying, ain't no wrong notes on a piano. This sound was polarizing in the jazz world at first. It was not universally accepted. Some listeners then and now think Monk's music is childlike, like he's just banging away at the keys. But you don't have to listen to much of his music to realize there's more going on. A lot more. Monk can play in key and very sweetly when he wants to. His technical skill is as good as many of the great pianists. The choices he makes, always right in the moment, are there because he decided they should be there in that moment. He was known for doing his recordings in only one take. It was other jazz geniuses like Miles Davis and John Coltrane who heard and appreciated what Thelonious Monk was doing. The 1961 album Thelonious Monk with John Coltrane helped many jazz listeners come around to Monk's sound. It wasn't just technical skill that made Monk so important. He had that, clearly. But if you consider his music in the context of the mid-20th century, what he was doing was literally unheard of at the time. In much the same way as Picasso revolutionized art by transforming the way people looked at and thought about art, Thelonious Monk spearheaded a movement that would transform the way people listened to and thought about music. A lot has also been said and written about his erratic behavior. He was known for dancing on stage, sometimes leaving the keys for extended solos and just dancing and twirling around on the stage. He could be seen in airports or backstage doing the same kind of thing. While all musicians dressed in suits back then, Monk was also known for wearing colorful hats. He would often be seen with a fez or a beret or some other kind of unique hat. You gotta remember that onstage antics and colorful costumes hadn't really arrived in music yet. In a way, Thelonious Monk was a predecessor to what would be considered wild acts later, like Little Richard or Elvis or David Bowie or Elton John. In 1964, Monk made the cover of Time magazine, joining an elite club of only five jazz musicians to ever do so. This landmark achievement drew international attention, and Monk would spend the next several years touring extensively, mostly in Europe, where his music found a whole new audience. In 1993, he was posthumously awarded a Grammy for Lifetime Achievement, and in 2006, he was awarded a Pulitzer Prize in music. Thelonious Monk is a musician's musician, but also one deeply loved by many others not in the scene. His influence likely helped musicians in other genres, especially rock, start to discover that supposedly wrong notes could sound great too. So by now it's hopefully pretty clear that Thelonious Monk is a giant of American music. And as such, it's good to celebrate him even in his hometown of Rocky Mount. And Rocky Mount has embraced its legendary son. There's a commemorative marker that stands in Thelonious Monk Plaza, right downtown. It's not a huge place and not particularly remarkable, but it does have a bizarre and somehow oddly appropriate all-seeing eye kind of sculpture. And it's right up the block from the Rocky Mount Event Center, which opened in 2018. There's also a community park named after him, although there's not much to see there. 
And then there's this impressive mural by artist, musician, and owner of the mural shop, Scott Nurkin. He's been working on a project to paint similar murals of famous North Carolina musicians, and you better believe we're going to be exploring those in future videos. It's nice to see that Rocky Mount remembers Thelonious Monk. I hope other towns do the same, and that moving forward, we really try to honor North Carolina's amazing artists. Let me know your thoughts or memories of Thelonious Monk. It's always a trip to see them in the comments. And while you're at it, please consider giving this channel a subscribe so you can see more about other famous North Carolina musicians. Thanks.